Thank you once again for joining us. Uh, I am really excited to be introducing the second in our series of new perspectives on women and the historic circus. This is a series that came about because we have had some really wonderful historians coming to do work in our archives and to research their own projects in, in the history of the circus through the holdings of the John and Mabel Ringley Museum of Art. And so we have invited a group of them to, to give us these presentations over time. And what I'm finding with this group of presenters is that we're really starting to find a unique thread about the experiences of women in the private and public spheres when it comes to especially early 20th century circus women. Uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting narratives and there's a lot to dissect about their experience with the circus. And to get at that today, we are joined by uh, my friend and a wonderful circus historian, Kat Vecchio. Kat is the chief creative officer for Fork Films. It's a women-led documentary film company. And in her own work, including the documentary film, This Is How I Roll, about men's roller derby, Kat has explored topics in popular entertainment, especially in American history. Her writings have been published by Narratively and Atlas Obscura, as well as the Circus Historical Society's publication, Bandwagon. So today, Kat is joining us to share a little bit about her observations on the presentation of circus women with circus women, model wives, performing domesticity at the circus. And Kat, it's all yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that warm introduction and I'm really excited to be here um, this morning and chat and share this with all of you. Um, so I'm going to just kind of jump right in and we're going to start with this 1904 newspaper article. And in 1904, this article titled, Women of Circus Are Model Wives, first appeared in the Chicago Tribune on June 5th. It was then republished in syndication. And while the headline varied slightly and sometimes the article was shortened, between June and December of 1904, it appeared in at least 25 newspapers and cities, mostly in the Midwest and along the East Coast. Now, often a syndicated article like this might start appearing in papers um, around the same time the circus arrived in town. And um, Kristen Lee, who is a fellow um, CHS member with me, and I think on this call today, um, there's a lot of work with um, circus route data and mapping. And she was kind enough to make a 1904 map for me. And I expected to find some kind of connection between when the article was appearing and a certain circus. And surprisingly, it's a lot more random than that, though there are some overlaps, especially um, when the article is first published and then a few months later with the Ringling Circus. So if I had to guess, I would say a Ringling press agent is responsible for this, but that's really a guess. And I, I you know, will kind of continue to look into this and find more examples of its publication and see if I can make a better connection. But so what does this say about why circus women make good wives? And this writer tells the reader that, quote, there are no women who are so little understood, whose real character is so little discussed from a correct standpoint as circus women. And he assures the reader that he spent several years as a theater critic, and therefore he knows what theater women are like. They are young, they're from all kinds of backgrounds, they're unmarried, they're nomadic. And he wants to assure the reader that circus women are nothing like theater women. He says that circus women are often born into the business and if not, they'll enter through marriage or a family connection. And quote, no manager of a first class circus will engage a female performer in any capacity unless she is accompanied by some male relative. He spends paragraphs um, making it known that circus women and circus people in general do not indulge in, quote, dissipation. And he seems to mostly mean drinking here, but as a note, dissipation could be a synonym for debauchery or decadence. So he's, he's defending them against more than just drunkenness. He shares that, quote, circus women are most devoted wives and mother, mothers who take life seriously and soberly. 
I believe that there is no other class of women in any sort of employment where they come in contact with the public, which supplies so little food for scandal. Quote, their home life in winter is pleasant and agreeable. He notes that most prefer to live in small towns or on farms and not in cities. And that, quote, few of them ever become indigent or dependent upon their families and the public authorities. After sharing a few more of their virtues, the writer closes by stating that he maintains that, quote, circus women are a credit to their calling and an honor to their sex. Now, there is certainly press um, this time and earlier and later that talks about circus women's performances and it covers their acts. But this article isn't unusual for the time. And there are some other examples. Um, on the um, left here, this article is from 1916. The one on the right is undated, but came from a scrapbook collection of articles from around the um, late 1890s. So the Camp Life for Complexions shares that the bevy of agile circus girls, or a bevy of agile girls who help to make the Barnum and Bailey Circus the madly delicious thing it is, are as wholesome and normal a lot of girls as one could hope to find in a denominational boarding school. It touts that the healthy lifestyle and exercise accounts for their natural rosy complexions and that they are, quote, better cared for, have a more uh, potent protection and lead more sheltered lives than the average city girl. The uh, ballet girls not given to flirting article um, it actually talks about multiple aspects of the John Robinson Circus, but the title and the first, I think, two paragraphs are focused on the circus ballet girl, um, which is similar to a chorus girl. And this writer wants to make sure to tell you that, quote, the standard of morality among circus girls is very high, that they, quote, think of nothing but their work, and also, if they happen to think of other things, it's very clear um, that they will get fired for flirting. So, yeah, sorry about that. All right, so this other article that appears in the women's section of the Brooklyn Eagle in 1911, it's making sure to note that, quote, young girls scarcely ever travel alone in the circus. If they are not chaperoned by a near relative, they are an integral part of a certain troop and as carefully guarded as though they actually were their own families. It also covers women's lives on the circus train and that while they are traveling, they take care to outfit their train berths to quote, suit their individual taste. Uh, the writer even goes on to describe the color of the curtains and quote, the pictures and trifles hung around. And while women, um, like all circus performers and workers, eat in the cook tent, the article takes care to describe that occasionally they cook, quote, on their portable stoves for family or small groups of friends, and that this creates a real atmosphere of home. Um, the article also says that they have sewing parties where they mend costumes or their clothes, and it even highlights occasional washing parties where they do laundry. So, why present circus women this way? Where did this interest in circus women's domestic lives come from and why focus on them as homemakers? They could have been cast as adventurers, daredevils. Um, they could have been cast as glamorous with many romances. But as we've seen, there is a clear emphasis on domesticity, on the home life in a very mundane, sheltered, protected way. And there are a few things going on here. And so I'm going to kind of paint with a broad brush. And so if you are a historian of the 19th and early 20th century America, um, please forgive the broad generalizations. There's a lot that's happening at this time. And I'm only going to touch on a few points because we only have about an hour. <laughs> but to understand this first, we need to go back to later decades in the 19th century, um, about the mid 19th century, sort of up to and into the 20th century. There's a few things happening. And one of them is that women are starting to work outside the home 
in much larger numbers than they have before. And with that work comes wages. At the same time, men's wages are rising. And these things are part of a shift to factory work where that's pulling people from farm work into cities, into towns. So what you have now are more people with money and leisure time. And if you are a circus owner, that is great news, especially because during the same time, the American circus has been growing. And to sustain this growth, you need to make sure you capture as much of this potential audience as possible. Now, at the same time over these decades, the circus is, um, I say the circus, I mean circus owners, promoters, they're, they're doing work to try to shake off any kind of seedy reputation that might be following the circus. They want to assure an audience that this is a clean, moral show. It is somewhere that you can come with your family. And one of the things that they have to contend with is that women who are now visibly in public life and visibly working, and specifically here I am talking about this new phenomenon, which is white middle class women. Um, they're being out in the world in this new way. People have concerns. There are questions, especially when you look at female performers, right? Just what kind of women are these? Remember that um, article we just looked at where the writer took real pains to tell you that they were not like theater women, right? Um, so what these articles are doing is they're doing this work to convince an audience that circus women are appropriate, that it is okay for you, a woman or man of high moral character to come to the circus and to look at these women. Right, so if you think about the articles that we just looked at, what you kind of come away with is, ladies and gentlemen, she might be wearing tights, hanging by her teeth high above your head, but don't worry, she cooks, she cleans, she cares about the color of her curtains, and there is a man here to look after her. Right, it is, they are fully appropriate. Now, Articles like this would occasionally come with press photos. And this one that we saw a little bit earlier, um, at the top, you have a clown wedding, you have equestrians posing with their horses, and then there are some domestic scenes over kind of on the, um, uh, the left, there is a woman reading a letter. Then at the bottom, what we have, this is a, a close up of the article I just showed you. What we have is um, slack wire performer, Victoria Cadona, both in practice on a wire um, and doing her laundry. And I think she is in the center here. And there is, this is a, a better version of that photograph. Um, and then this is another uh, press photograph of, of Victoria. Um, and this, this press photo, um, it's clearly very highly staged of performers in costumes doing their laundry. Uh, it's photos like this that kind of got me down this rabbit hole of looking at how circus women's domestic lives were presented to the public in the early 20th century. So throughout the rest of this presentation, um, what I want to show you is that I've grouped some photographs of domestic tasks and themes. The photos are going to range from um, in decades from around 1910 to the mid 1940s. Um, and the other thing that varies in these photos is who took them and why. So let's start with laundry. There are so many photos of laundry. This photograph was taken by Frederick Glazier, who was a professional photographer and he captured many photos of circus performers. Um, for a time, he was even the official photographer for Barnum and Bailey. This is Mrs. Robert Stickney, who is possibly actually hanging out her laundry. Unlike the very staged press photo um, that we just looked at, Mrs. Stickney is not in costume. Um, she looks like she might be wearing an overdress or kind of a, a robe of some kind. And 
I think she looks a little unsure about participating in this photograph. Um, and as Jennifer and I were talking about this photograph last week, she reminded me that, of course, the camera Glazier is using here is not small. Um, it would have taken some time to set up. So, you know, he, Glazier, chose this scene, chose Laundry, asked her to pose in this photograph. Um, and you know, this is something I want to note, though, as the photographs we're going to look at, some are very, very highly posed, um, say, press photographs. Some are like this, which are more candid, but still set up, still staged in some way or posed. And then others are much more candid, but even just the presence of the photographer and camera is often going to change that scene to some extent, pose it to some extent. And remember that these photographers are choosing the scenes that they are capturing. Um, so with that, to show you a lot more photographs of laundry, Glazier also captured this photo of the Lorch ladies and their washing. And so, right, why laundry? It's a very visible form of domestic work. Um, and circus women doing laundry is, it's, it's this oddly popular subject. Um, and I think there's, there's a couple of reasons for this, but here are a few others, um, photographs that I've captured or sort of found from the archive that were captured. Um, I love the little boy here uh, with his little, little hand goggles. Um, and just kind of throughout the decades that this is a reoccurring theme, um, right? To sort of varying degrees of candid and posed. So that's a pretty small sampling <laughs> of the circus women do laundry photos available. And just to note in my research for this presentation, I did find two photos of men, uh, circus uh, men, either workers or performers doing their laundry. I'm sure there are others, but to be clear, there are far less of those photographs of, of men doing laundry um, than there are of women and their laundry. And I ended on this photograph because I want to sort of point out that besides laundry being a visible um, type of domestic work, it also has a sort of voyeuristic component to it, right? It's letting you see intimate apparel. There are a lot of uh, bras and underwear in this photograph. And this is another one that is, you know, very highly composed of everyone in their costume um, kind of each holding a clothespin. And, you know, as I talked about at the start of this presentation, highlighting circus women's domestic labor and interest was a way to make them appear appropriate and proper. Um, and non-circus people were often very curious about performers' lives, how they lived. So it's also offering that sort of sense of behind the scenes as you go. But as we see, here, there does start to become a more kind of blatant, um, what I, I consider kind of a voyeuristic quality. And to highlight that, I wanna show you this, this article from 1928. Because by the late 1920s, American circus going public is no longer fretting about, you know, women visibly at work. Um, and so what you see though is still this interest in domestic life, but it's taken a shift. And I'm going to read the kind of opening paragraph so and change here. And I'm sure you will spot the difference from the articles that we opened this presentation with. All right, so the headline, 100 girls and women bathe and dress in a single tent in vast democracy of circus. 100 girls and women bathing and dressing in a single tent, a subject worthy of a Goya, muscle women, all of them, grandmothers, mothers, daughters, for the circus has come to Brooklyn and life under the big tent is being vividly lived at the end of DeKalb Avenue, Carline. Old women with graying hair, still muscular, young women, very beautiful of build, many of them, 
all muscles like steel and cool heads to balance them. A hundred trunks placed back to back beside each other in rows across the sawdust covered earth to form aisles. Every woman with great iron bucket filled with hot water from the cook tent. Some of them are drying their thick untamed hair. Others swing Turkish towels across bare shoulders. <laughs> I mean, this is just so voyeuristic and it, it creates this very intimate picture of women dressing and bathing for public consumption. Um, and this, this circus poster that I've put with this from um, the early 1930s, I think, kind of highlights how we've, we've shifted a narrative of how we're presenting um, circus women uh, to an audience. The article um, here goes on to mention their silk lingerie or under things not once but twice. Um, and as you can see from this quote I pulled, laundry still makes an appearance. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's a little bit different now. Um, and specifically the, the quote says, outside the women's dressing tent, the wash hangs out frankly on the line. And in contradiction to other years, most of the underwear is now of silk, now is of silk. The fact that the men's dressing tent is just a step across the lot makes no difference. The muscle people are children of nature and unsophisticated. Um, so, kind of giving you this contrast of sort of how at the beginning of the 20th century um, and just a few decades later, kind of how this narrative and this interest in circus women's domestic life um, is presented to the public, how it sort of shaped um, how the public is, is being asked to think about female circus performers. So I'd love to kind of share some other examples of what circus women's domestic life looked like over the years, both a combination of these highly staged photographs with more candid and kind of give you this contrast because the domestic life these articles are talking about isn't coming out of nowhere. They are heightening um, what living life on a circus lot and the circus trade actually was like. So this is another photograph that I really love. And this came from a, a private collection um, of, of two women who have a collection of um, women's photographs. So I know very little about this. If anyone attending today recognizes the costuming themes here or the wagon in the background and has a sense of what show this might be, I'd love to, to know in the chat or at the Q&A. Um, but not nearly as popular as laundry um, is, is sewing and knitting though this, this appears, this idea that um, it's, a, it's kind of presented as a quaint sort of domestic hobby. And, um, you know, this is, is so very clearly kind of put together. It's probably a press photograph. Um, as Jennifer and I looked at this together last week, she commented on the white heel that is just digging into the dirt <laughs> and how someone is going to have to clean that. Either the performer herself or the wardrobe uh, team who will not be happy about this. Um, but all of the, the kind of the pointed toes, the grouping, um, this, this does not look like a kind of natural occurrence. Um, but the fact that there was this idea, somebody, photographer, press agent, someone had of everyone grab your knitting while you're in costume and let's come take this photograph, right? It's, it's intended to tell you something about these women. This is a sketch from a 1911 newspaper article about um, the opening of the Barnum and Bailey Circus in, in Brooklyn. Um, I think it's the, no, in, in sorry, in New York, it's uh, the Tribune. Um, and there's some humor in this sketch, right? Here is this woman um, in her costume, sitting very daintily, um, stitching on some embroidery, and it says below it, death-defying equestrian awaits her cue. And so we're using this domestic task in kind of humorous contrast to the work she is about to go do um, in the circus ring. But 
some women did pass the time by knitting and many of them sewed, they sewed their own costumes. So, you know, what does that actually look like when not heightened for public consumption in the same way? And this is also a death-defying equestrian. This is Mae Worth. Um, and it appears that she has some, some knitting in her lap um, as she sits with, um, who may be her husband, I'm not sure who the men are in this photograph, um, but on the lot of the circus, um, potentially between the matinee and evening show. Um, a few decades later, um, we, have, we have more kind of leisure time. Um, this woman sitting on the trunks um, appears to be, to be knitting. Um, and so this is, this is a, a real way that you spent your time, um, but that again, it's sort of interesting that this becomes a highlighted thing to present to the public. Um, another subject that occasionally appears is letter writing. Um, letter writing to home usually is how it's presented or reading letters. Um, and so again, this contrast of, um, you know, these, these photos are a few years apart, um, but this is May Worth again over here on the right side of the screen in 1917. You do not know the identity of the performer um, sitting on her trunk. But again, kind of a, a, an interesting way of, of how the, this is presented um, for public consumption. Also sometimes just leisure time, conversations, um, becomes highly staged. Again, in costume, toes pointed, sort of attractively grouped. Um, but some examples of leisure that are potentially a casual moment that was asked to be posed um, a few decades earlier than the photo we just saw. Um, or I think of a very candid shot. It looks like maybe only one or two people in this photo um, are at least aware of or looking at the photographer. Um, and so what sort of leisure actually looks like um, versus again, kind of these stage presentations for public consumption. Um, another popular topic as we saw earlier with the article is the dressing tent. How circus women uh, got dressed, got made up, lived um, kind of these really private moments um, on the circus lot. And so you see photographs um, like this, and I think that this is pretty highly, highly staged. It appears to me that the trunk and chair have been brought outside for better light, um, clearly very posed. Um, this photograph I think is an interesting combination. It's, it's very posed, but it does appear that we are now actually inside a dressing tent. It, it, potentially is her trunk, um, but again, kind of this, this staged glamorous making up. And then going back another few, few decades into 1913, um, there is this, this photograph, which perhaps gives us um, ourselves kind of the most candid voyeuristic look into the dressing tent, though of course everyone is turned to face the photographer. Um, but this, this curiosity about these personal spaces shows up as well. Um, there is this photograph, which you know, if you are a, a very successful um, featured performer, you might have a personal or a private space on the lot in which to, to dress, to rest, um, to, to live during the day. And this is Fred and Ella Bradna. Um, I don't know, probably somebody on this call does know who the clown is. Um, but, you know, I, I really, I really love this. Just you hanging out in your, your tights and your tutu or your, your skirt with your husband wearing his top hat, um, and a clown and a horse and your dog, a bird on your lap. I think the only, the only individual in this photograph who is posing naturally is the dog hiding under the table in the wagon. <laughs> which I, it took me a few looks at this photograph to see, but, but there is just really so, so much here that is presented, the table with the flowers, um, especially when you look at this photograph of the same couple. This is, again, Fred and Ella Bradna, um, their dog, in a, again, probably posed, but much more kind of natural state of, 
of what their life might have looked like with their wagon, their awning um, over them. And this is another photograph um, that appears to be kind of the same, the same day, maybe kind of around the same time. But what's interesting about this photograph and sort of how much more um, relaxed it looks than the very first one of them we saw is that you know, this photograph comes from a scrapbook um, made by a fellow performer um, and potentially taken by him as well. And so that sense again of like, who's taking photos and why? And so here it is potentially much more about capturing your colleagues or your friends um, in a moment um, as a way to remember that year, that season, and is much more casual um, than the earlier photo we saw. So one of the, the places of personal space that you'll often see described in articles, but you'll rarely see published photos of is actually life on the train. And this is again, May Worth. I don't know the woman seated. It may be her mother. It could be a sister, um, likely a family member. Um, but this is the inside of the Worth family stateroom on the train. Um, and you know, it's a very intimate, very personal space. So most likely we can make the assumption that the photograph is captured by a family or friend. Um, it was also part of a scrapbook collection in, in an archive. Um, of other um, very kind of candid photographs. Some of the other ones that you've seen of Mayworth um, in this presentation came from that same collection. Um, but the sort of the, the domestic life um, of these women kind of as they, they lived is sort of capturing, capturing this. Um, and even in such a personal private space, whoever is taking these photographs, somebody either Mayworth herself or the photographer has suggested that she sit and pose as if she is making up at her dresser. So there is still this, this idea of what performing domesticity, what like, you know, how to inhabit these spaces for posterity, for consumption um, that I think is very interesting. So, you may have noticed that one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is motherhood. And in my research, what I found is motherhood is, is mentioned in these articles. Um, this clipping you see um, uh, on the, the right here, the beautiful, um, beautiful females in tights are good wives and acrobatic children say their prayers. And there are children who appear in um, circus photographs but you don't see motherhood talked about um, in the early 20th century or, or later in the same way you see these, these other domestic tasks touted, right? Um, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that performers um, often had to, had to or either chose to leave small children at home with family or other caregivers. Um, some performers could and did travel with young children before they were performing in a, in a family act. But I think for press purposes, right, um, the idea of a career woman raising her child on a circus lot, it likely doesn't convey the picture of mundane domesticity or the more titillating domesticity that we see later. It doesn't serve either of those narratives. So while motherhood is mentioned, you don't usually get the same emphasis on circus women as good mothers as you do say on good wives or on good housekeepers. But there is one really fun exception. There may be others, but the one that I am most familiar with is Katie Brombach, um, who performed as Sandwina. Now, she was a strong woman, um, I think around the height of her popularity in around 1911, 1912, though she, she toured for many years before and after that. Um, but uh, this photo, she's touring with the Barnum and Bailey Circus in the 19 teens. And there's a challenge here. It's an interesting conundrum. How do you make a strong woman aspirational instead of threatening or off-putting? Um, and one way is by advertising her beauty, 
right? Beauty and strength. She's posed in these, these sort of beautiful kind of pinup quality ways. Now you might think another way would be to talk about her husband. She is married. That could be a way to um, show how domestic uh, and feminine she is. But there is a, a problem with that in that her husband was a participant in her act. Um, famously, she used him as the weight she lifted. <laughs> so I, two of my favorite pieces here, um, there is lucky woman, she can toss husband about like a biscuit. Uh, and it shows you that she is both holding her husband and child uh, in one arm, hoisting him over the head, and then also just sort of holding him lovingly like a plank down here. There's a really sweet look between the two of them um, while she's just carrying him about. Uh, this um, series of sketches over here, you remember the, the death-defying equestrian and her embroidery. In that same series of sketches right next to her, is a sketch of Katie Sandwina shows what can be done with a husband as she's hoisting him aloft. So while the press is delighted by her relationship, uh, her performing relationship with her husband, it's not going to do a lot of work to make her not seem threatening. And there's a lot, you could really do a whole presentation on unpacking um, press presentation of Sandwina, but What's really interesting is that what they do focus on is her as a mother. So, you know, here she is being cast in this article as, you know, mother can bring up giants, mothers can bring up giants by advice of strong woman. There's other articles that tout her as being the mother of Hercules. Um, she says in this series of quotes from a different article, she says, um, I left my country and do my circus work and washing, ironing and cooking that my son may be a millionaire. And she was, she was Bavarian. Um, another um, headline from a, a, a publication called um, Physical Culture, I think. Um, I have lost my note here, but a remarkable mother, a professional gymnast who does not scorn the duties of motherhood. Um, her, her laundry also gets a headline, even though the article that follows mentions nothing about her laundry, a circus strong woman likes the washboard. So for Sandwina, um, her motherhood becomes the thing that makes her aspirational for women. She can raise giants, she can raise Hercules. Her physical fitness and her beauty combine to bring about incredible sons. And so this is this one place where you really see motherhood touted as this domestic um, aspirational feature for a circus performer. And again, there may be other examples of this, but this is the one that I am most familiar with and, and really love. There's, there's a lot about um, how the, the press and the circus promoters kind of navigate promoting her. So I will kind of wrap up here. I'll leave you with um, this slide with some of the sources I consulted to put this talk together, as well as the sources for many of the images in this. Um, and if you are interested in this topic, there are scholars and historians who have really done a deep dive into circus women and domesticity and kind of how the press and the public navigated these strong um, visibly, you know, working women. Um, so I will um, leave this here and then I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen in a minute. But, but Jennifer, if I can hand it back to you. Absolutely. Kat, thank you so much. That was really interesting and some wonderful photos, some of which I had not seen before. Um, we're going to open up to questions in just a second, but I'm, I'm going to start with mine. And I was wondering if, if you even have kind of uh, an ability to track back to when you started honing in on these images. Did you first recognize them in kind of the printed material that's generated from circuses, you know, programs and things like that? Or I, I'm just wondering what, what made you start focusing on this? Where did you have the aha? So I think one of the places that I started my circus research was um, a book called The Circus Age by Janet Davis. Um, and she has a, a full chapter 
I mean, about circus women and, and delving into kind of the social history. And so there, she touches on some of this idea and some of these um, headlines, but then it was, it was two images. It's one of the women knitting. Um, and again, kind of early in my research, I had been clued into some women in Brooklyn who had this massive collection of photographs of women and they had a small box of circus photographs. And so I went to see, and I had never seen, and I still haven't come across it in, in other archives, the, the photo of the women knitting and just thought, you know, how interesting um, and what an interesting visual representation of some of these ideas. And then um, the two photos of Victoria Cadona, um, Greg Parkinson very generously sent me a few years ago and looking at that staged laundry, right? Full costume, hair done, wash bucket set up with a background, you know, everyone like very daintily washing. I mean, you don't daintily wash with a washboard. <laughs> that is labor. Um, and so it was sort of these two that were really a question. And then when I started to kind of look for some of the articles that had been cited in various um, scholarly work and realizing that the circus women model wives um, appeared, you know, my initial kind of quick search found it 25 times. It's um, definitely if I did a deep dive looking for all instances of it, I'm sure it would be many more. And so kind of realizing that, that clearly there was an appetite for this content. And then you start to see in looking at the different scrapbooks um, over the years, I would kind of like, whenever I would sort of find one of these examples, I would kind of file it away. Um, and at some point realized that I had kind of amassed this you know, folder as it was of all of these examples. And so it was just a kind of a slow, a slow rabbit hole. But those two images of just those highly staged images of domestic work in a way that like, I don't know, I never get fully dressed for like a work meeting and then decide to like do my laundry, right? I don't think any of us do. I mean, if you do, great, but like just that contrast and how contrived was, was fascinating to me. It's uh, during, during your talk this time, and Kat and I had talked some of these concepts that she was presenting out before, but sitting back and just listening, I was, I was struck, um, and, and the group that's here with us, we have museum members, but also a lot of members from Circus Historical Society, I think will recognize this, the ability to do a good job reading a photograph, right? To not just immediately look at it and go, oh, look, there are ladies doing laundry, but hey, wait, there are women, in costumes that they would want to keep clean, you know, to, to actually just pause for that moment and think through like you were just describing. People don't do laundry like that. Um, I, I think that ability to read media is so important to the work of history. And I, I was struck throughout this presentation of, of how diligently you did that with, with each photo that you shared with us. So. Um, Kat and I could keep talking about this all day, but I do want to invite the group here to uh, participate and add in any questions. Um, so yeah, I think- We've gotten a couple of questions through the, the chat. Kat, thank you so much. That was a fascinating talk. Um, uh, one of the first questions is from Ingrid. I'm wondering sort of about, was perhaps this domesticated portrayal something the women themselves might've wanted? So thinking about sort of agency, how much of this came from the circus PR machine or how much of it was sort of something that they would want to self-present. Um, and she says, you know, the alternative might've been that by leaving home and living this itinerant lifestyle, they would have been you know, portrayed as floozies. So mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts on that? Thank you, Ingrid. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And yes, I think absolutely. Um, and that's a whole, I think, section that I could have covered, but also just sort of time. One of the things Jennifer and I actually talked about and Jennifer reminded me of is right, Lillian Lietzel, who her tent on the lot um, really presented. And for her, there was, I think a sense of what I would call glamor, um, but there was absolutely women um, concerned about their own self-presentation. And, you know, to different, different reasons and different motives, as you said, to make sure that they seemed appropriate. Um, I love um, circus women's memoirs and autobiographies. And there's um, Josie DeMott Robinson, who was an equestrian um, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, talks about her difficulties with townspeople, or she calls them gillies, uh, non-circus people, and how, you know, as a child, despite her best efforts to explain her life to them, they always assumed the worst, that she was forced to work as a child, that she was scared, you know, 
Um, and that, you know, comments about her mother and like, can't she iron those children's dresses, right? There, there is this tension between circus women, circus people and non-circus people. And so one of the ways that women likely navigated that tension is to make sure that they always appeared um, appropriate. And then also if you were potentially more successful and more in the public eye as, um, as a, a featured performer, you might also be trying to think about, um, like say Lietzel, presenting yourself as that glamorous featured performer because you benefited from that, um, that visibility. So absolutely, um, they were part of um, and had that agency. Um, and it's, I think there's a push and pull too of the, the rules um, for circus performers and for women the way circus press agents um, presented to them, the way women presented themselves. Um, one of the, the spaces that I really love where you can kind of pull that apart is there was a suffrage meeting in 1912 and trying to pull apart what is um, the women themselves wanting to participate, what is press agents sort of staging a press uh, moment and, and trying to decipher those, those moments of agency and, and not. Um, is is super interesting. Thank you so much for that. And, and as you were giving that response, Sarah Chapman um, added in the chat that she was constantly interviewed and photographed um, by the media regarding family life. So mm. sort of echoing that. Um, and then a little bit related to, to the end of your answer there, uh, Kathleen has a question. I read somewhere that women in the circus were on the forefront of women's rights as they were more independent than women in the general public. Are there examples of this sort of beyond the, the suffragist meeting that you've just mentioned? Um, is this something that was just generally accepted? And then uh, were women more competitive with each other than usual in the circus setting? So mm. a couple of big questions there. Yeah, I can, I can only kind of answer this question, I think, based on the, the research that I've done. I think that this is both of those questions, I think, are... Um, you know, deep dives in and of themselves. Um, I think that to me, there's potentially kind of varying opinions on this, but to me, the, the women at, circus women at the forefront of women's rights, yes and no. Um, there are examples of, again, women participating in suffrage of certain um, circus owners allowing suffragists to, um, you know, hand out flyers on the lot. Um, and I, I wrote an article for Bandwagon about um, circus and suffrage. And you also see um, suffrage groups outside of the circus capitalizing on circus day to, um, to connect with the crowds. Um, you know, individual women, um, it's interesting, like for example, Sandwina, one of the ways that the press liked to talk about her was that she made anti-suffragist tremble. And there are these sketches of her um, really kind of uh, running her own house uh, in, in really kind of comical ways that show the anxiety of, of strong women, um, like physically strong women um, in, in society. Um, and she actually was, was uh, attended the suffrage meeting in 1912. The, the woman I look at who, who actually um, organized or helped organize that suffrage meeting, Jessie DeMott Robinson, what I think is really interesting about her story is that it becomes clear for her two things in her life. One, as she retires from the circus and makes a comeback, how much losing her physical autonomy costs her and how much she values her physical strength and how heartbroken she is when she realizes 15 years of living as a society lady has cost her that and how she has to work to get it back. And she also clearly, um, begins to understand financial autonomy and how important that is for women, especially circus women who earn their own money. Um, and that how, you know, if they are in a family act, it might be the mother or father who controls those purse strings. If they are married, their husband has a right to their income. And so she does these, these sort of arguments about like, you have a right to your own income. And so I think that there are absolutely individual women like her who, you know, probably very much by their own experiences in running their own careers, in living independently, um, probably very much saw and uh, 
understood the um, the need for women's rights. Um, and I think there's, there's also something about, um, again, sort of as an audience member, kind of seeing that potential, seeing in front of you um, women who lived different lives than you did. Um, and especially without um, TV and movies or initially radio, um, having access to what that would look like um, from a small, a small town or a rural area would have been, I think, quite stunning to, to see and consider. So, you know, that's not a, fully an answer to your question, but it's kind of how I think about it. I think that there's um, continued research to be done on that. And I forget what the other part of that question was. <laughs> I think it was sort of, it would, do you have any sense of were women more competitive with oh, one another in the circus? Yeah, I think, I think there was some, you, you hear, and I think that people on this call who have actually um, worked as performers in a circus can speak to that too. There is both a sense of, in my research, camaraderie and family um, and an understanding that like, the outside world does not understand us, that we, we have each other. But yes, like your livelihood, right, depends on your act, depends on your advancing it, you're developing more skills. And again, um, the example I can think of has to do with, with Lillian Lietzel, but also Ariel's Tiny Klein. If I'm remembering correctly, I think in Tiny Klein's memoir that is available, it's, it's been republished, Janet Davis was the editor for it. Um, Klein talks about uh, Lietzel recommending to her a, a iron jaw and not a rings, a Roman rings act like she had. And, and so, you know, Klein kind of thought that that um, probably was a good idea, <laughs> that you didn't want to quite go head to head with Lietzel um, on the same kind of aerial apparatus that she used. So yes, I think that there is, there is both. There is camaraderie, but there is also clear protectiveness and um, ambition because it's, it's your livelihood. It's, it's how you, um, you make a living. So I would say that that, that did exist, but um, that's the one example I can really think of at the moment. Thank you. I've got a, well, it initially sounds like a more straightforward question, but I'm sure it depends on the, the time in the circus. Do you know what percentage of the performers were women? I don't, um, and it's a really good question. It's going to depend on the year. It's going to depend on the show. Um, and, you know, I think I would answer that by looking at route books um, because they do actually separate usually the performers by, um, by gender, um, or at least many, many of the ones I've seen, I don't know that all of them do, um, but no, I, I don't um, and I would I wouldn't want to guess because I think that that really that really is going to change over the decades. Um, Great, thank you. Um, Jennifer, did you get any questions on your end that you wanted to share? I know I've been. I have not received any through the chat. I think um, I know we've got a, a little bit more time. If there is anyone who would like to unmute and ask something, you're certainly welcome to. Um, I see Eveline. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right, but it's nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah, that, that what a nice surprise because I certainly enjoyed your uh, previous presentation. Um, uh, just an observation, basically. I love this strong uh, woman. She was 220 pounds. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, and she could keep that all together. The other thing that's really nice about photographs uh, and film, etc., is that there's no smell. I can imagine uh, <laughs> these, these women, um, you know, part of the feminine mystique is your perfume and, uh, you know, not just how you look, but your overall uh, aura and uh, I think the circus really had a certain smell about it, um, just to bring that up, especially I know I used to uh, own horses and when I got off the back of one of those horses and finished mucking out a stall, it was not uh, delightful. <laughs> so uh, just to kind of put that in the back of your mind while they appeared uh, that everything is fine. It, 
may not have in the sense of actual living there. And uh, I really enjoy this presentation. It's wonderful. It's almost as if uh, these circus ladies were the forefront of, for dare I say, women's lib, <laughs> which is really interesting. Thank you. I think that's one of the the joys of of this this series as we're pulling it out. But uh, it, circus is, as I've, I've said to many people before, this wonderful um, frame for women's experience over an extended time because we see we see them in print, we see imagery of them advertising the circus. So you get this sense of women's roles in this this broad public sphere, but to follow up on your point, and I think Kat, you, you, the, your whole presentation is about this, the image we get is of these women as still being soft and pliable, feminine mm -hmm. and all of, all of those things, but you're right. The circus lot smelled, they worked really hard. <laughs> you know, that nothing about that life was soft and feminine, really. Um, the, the moments that were captured are, are almost unique in the sense that they were doing that. It's really interesting. Yeah, that's a, a really great reminder about the things that you can't capture in photographs or, or newspaper articles. And you notice that none of the newspaper articles dwell on the smell. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, oh. I think um, I don't see any other questions in the in the chat. I want to thank you so much, Kat and, and Jennifer as well for facilitating. This has been a fantastic program and we're so appreciative of your time and expertise. And thank you all for attending. And yeah, thank I'm you. gonna add really quickly that Laura has dropped in a link to the rest of this series. We have another presentation coming up next week and then two more following. Um, I do urge anyone who's able to, to join us for them. Uh, and I very much want to thank Kat for a really interesting presentation. I can't wait to see what fantastic photos you dig out of the next search into the archives. Thank you all. Thank you.